Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. <laughs> so I know that uh, you guys have been working through the, the book of Philippians, and it always is a little odd for me to come in in the middle of a series and, and, and start preaching the next text. Um, but, man, when I read Philippians, I just couldn't find a text in Philippians that I didn't want to preach on. And so I am, I am very glad that I'm, I'm able to, to share today from the book of Philippians. Um, today we're going to be reading from Philippians uh, chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. So go ahead and pull out your Bibles. Um, again, it's going to be Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. And I'll be reading today out of the, uh, the CSB, so if you hear a few little, little, diff, uh, little changes from whichever translation you may be uh, reading out of today, that's probably why. So let's read the word of the Lord. It says, Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or, an, or am absent, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, contending together for the faith of the gospel, not being frightened in any way by your opponents. This is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. And this is from God, for it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I have. Let's pray. God, as we study your word today, I pray, God, that you will allow us to have open hearts and minds. Lord, your word is truth, and we pray, God, that you will speak through your word today. Speak truth into our hearts. Let what we what we read and what we study today change our lives so that we do not walk away from this place the same way we came. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm, I'm excited to be with you guys today. And I, I do want to introduce myself a little bit, tell you a little bit about me. Um, hopefully, uh, you won't have to hear about me much because now you guys will know. Um, I'm originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, moved up here a couple of years ago to attend seminary. I've been married for almost 17 years. Um, I have three children. Um, my son, who's with me today, is 13. Um, then I have a 10-year-old daughter, and then my youngest will be five in just a few weeks. Uh, and we love being up in this area. We love Kentucky and Louisville wasn't on our list of places to move ever. But now that we're here, it's like, oh, it's a pretty nice place. So we're enjoying it. Um, prior to, to going to seminary, I had various and sun-dry sun dry jobs. I spent a number of years in the military, um, spent eight years as a police officer once I left the military, and then a youth pastor and a business owner. It, it's, been a, it's been a wild ride that God has led me on. And I often look back at it and I think, this isn't really the path that I thought I would take to, to become a pastor. Um, I, had a, I had a deal with God growing up. I, I was raised in the church, and, and I had told God, I will do anything you want me to do, as long as it's not be a pastor. And <laughs> for many, many years, I thought we had that, that mutual understanding. <laughs> and, and then uh, God said, you said you'd do anything that I asked you to do. And now I cannot imagine doing anything but this, doing anything but sharing the word of God with people, Amen. but Amen. worshiping with people, pouring into their lives and having them pour into mine. And so I am I'm truly blessed to be here today. I, this isn't where I thought, ask me 15 years ago where I'd be, 10, five years ago where I'd be, it wouldn't be here. But God is doing amazing and, and mighty things. So. so as we work through Paul's letter to the church of Philippi, we're going to do a quick recap. 
Um, we're only in chapter 1, so it's not going to take very long. Now, the letter that Paul wrote um, was written to Philippi, which is a Roman colony. Um, and Philippi was known for its patriotic nationalism. And because of this, when Paul set up the church, and we find him setting up the church in Acts 16, the church of Philippi, Paul was met with strong resistance. Because those who believed in Jesus were persecuted greatly for not worshiping the gods of the Romans. Now, if they had simply added Jesus to the list of gods, no one would have cared. But they said, no, Jesus is the one true God. And this caused a lot of problems. But even though they were persecuted, and even though they went through great suffering, there remained a vibrant church, a vibrant community who loved Jesus. Paul starts the letter to the church of Philippi by giving thanks for the continued partnership in, with him in, in spreading the gospel. You see, Paul at this point was in, in prison. And when you read this letter, it doesn't really sound like a prison letter. If I were in prison, I don't know if my letter would be quite so joyful, um, quite so optimistic. Thankfully, I've, I've never had to be in prison for an extended period of time, just taking people there, booking them in, and then leaving. <laughs> but Paul was sitting here writing this letter to them from prison. They had, the church of Philippi had just sent a large financial gift up to him because in, in that day and time when you were in prison, the state did not fund your stay. So you were relying on friends and family to provide for you food and clothing and anything else you needed to survive. And Paul rejoices that they have loved him so greatly. Paul then goes on to summarize about some of the hardships he's going through, but also Paul is rejoicing. We see in uh, verses 14 through 18 that Paul says that many people, many brothers have gained confidence in the Lord because of his imprisonment. And because of his imprisonment, somehow that has actually caused people to be able to speak more fearlessly about the gospel. He then says that, you know, there are even some people who are speaking, who are, who are sharing Christ out of envy, but there are still others out of goodwill. The people who are sharing out of goodwill are doing it because of the love of God. And the others who are, are speaking out of envy and selfishness, they were actually doing it to, to cause problems for Paul. But Paul said in verse 18, what does it matter? Only that in every way, whether from false motives or from true, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. By the time we get to verses 22, 23, one of my favorite passages from Paul. Paul is talking about his desire, whether it be through his suffering whether that be in his life or even by his death, that Christ will be honored in his body. He says, now if I live on, if I live on in the flesh, this means fruitful work for me. And if, I, and if I die, then I get to be with my Savior. So, so what should I choose? I am torn between the two because I long to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. So even here, Paul is looking out for the community of believers, recognizing that while he is going through suffering, there is something higher, something, something bigger, something more important that God has him on this earth for. And because of that, he wants to stay with it. Paul knows that if he were to die, he'd be with the Savior. But he prays that God will let him live to benefit the church. When we get to verses 27 through 30, 
which is what we're pre which is what I'm preaching on today. A lot of people say this is the main main focus of the entire letter to the church of Philippi. Paul urges them to stand together for the gospel in the face of persecution and suffering. Now, unless we think that Paul's words do not apply to us today, let's think for a second. Paul is asking them to, to stand together, to be unified. What is one of the main things that Satan does as he, as he seeks to stand in the way of the gospel of God? And you see, Satan will do whatever he can to divide and discourage us in order to stifle the spread of the gospel. And you think that Paul being thrown in prison, in prison and the persecution that the church of Philippi was taking would have stifled the gospel but we find that's not what happened. Now, I joined the Army just after 9-11, and I spent the first 16 weeks of, uh, of my time in basic training at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, it's where they train um, a lot of people, but mainly it's, a, it's where they train infantry. Now, if you've never been to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia, then... You're, you're probably blessed. It's not the most fun place ever. <laughs> and I remember that the first time we were given a day pass while I was in basic training, it was about 14 weeks into the training. So we're right there at the end. And we were allowed for the first time in months to wear our civilian clothes instead of the, the military-issued uniform that we had. And we were loaded onto buses and driven into town and dropped off at a mall so we could have a taste of normal life again. It wasn't until then that I realized that I had changed. Because as I sat in the mall watching the soldiers I had been training with for the past 14 weeks wander about, and then watching the civilians as they interacted and, and went about their life, I realized that we stood out. And it wasn't just because of the haircut. It wasn't just because that at some point during the last 14 weeks, everyone had lost a large amount of weight and our civilian clothes were looser than usual. No, it was something more than that. I realized that the civilian world wasn't my home anymore. You see... The people who, just a few months before, I would have blended in so well with, all of a sudden, I, I looked at them and their life felt fake, felt superficial. They were, as at least it seemed to me, living for themselves, for their self-interest. But, but the soldiers I was, walking, I was watching as they walked around, I realized that, that each and every one of us would lay down our life for each other. You see, we weren't just fellow soldiers. We had become family. Have you ever fell out of place? Think about maybe the last time you were on vacation to somewhere far away from here, and maybe you're trying to find somewhere, and you're walking around, and you kind of have that, that look of, oh, there should be a restaurant around here somewhere. What pops in my mind is the movies where people visit like New York City and they're standing on a corner looking at the hustle and bustle and the skyscrapers and, and they just look lost. And I can picture, you know, the, the, the people who live in the city looking and as they walk by, they kind of give that look and they're like, you're not from here. At some time in our lives, we all feel out of place. At some time in our lives, we will all go through something that changes us, too. Something that we can never go back from. This is where Paul finds his readers. They're going through something 
that was changing them. And here we find that Paul starts by exhorting the believers to be unified. In verse 27, we see that it says, Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, live your lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or am absent, I will hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, in one accord, and contending together for the faith of the gospel. Paul starts off by reminding his readers and us that they no longer belong to this world. You see, in just a few pages later, when we get to Philippians 3.20, he tells them outright, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does it mean to be a citizen of heaven? Remember that Philippi was a colony known for its patriotic nationalism. So when Paul tells them to live their lives worthy of the gospel, he grounds it in their new status as citizens of heaven. This would have made them stand out in Philippi. And if we apply this to our lives, we too will stand out. Think about how similar our lives in America right now are to those of the Church of Philippi. I mean, think about it. In America, we can worship God, right? But really, the culture tells us, if you're going to worship God, make sure you add him to the list of liberalism or sexual immorality or even the worship of country. The world doesn't mind if we have our truth as long as we fit it in with their truth as well. But that's not what we are to do. We are not to fit in with the culture around us, but instead we should live in a way that shows the world that this isn't our home. Amen. We have to live our life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Paul's testimony that his mission served to advance the gospel, even while he was in chains, is the basis of the authority when he, tells, when he challenges his readers to live that life worthy of the gospel. This is an all-important link between the previous section and the one that's coming up. Between Paul's life and theirs, between Paul's life and ours, that link is the gospel of Christ. All of Paul's all of Paul's rules that he lists are incorporated under just one thing, the gospel of Christ. You see, Paul doesn't impose a long list of rules. He presents the person of Christ, the good news of Christ, the story of Christ, and the gospel is to rule the community. You see, Paul desires that they stand firm, when we are grounded in what, when we are grounded in, in the gospel, in truth, we find that it's much easier to do what Paul exhorts us to do, which is to stand firm. Paul lists three aspects of what it is to be a citizen of heaven. The standing firm in one spirit is the first. The standing together in one accord and standing without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. These three phrases unpack what it is to be a good citizen of heaven. Now, to stand firm is not an easy thing to do, especially in a hostile environment. And what Paul is describing, he doesn't think it's easy. He's not giving them a cookie-cutter answer, a bumper-sticker answer that says, if you do this, you got it. Life is going to be it's going to be cake. Don't worry about it. Paul speaks in the same sentence of opposition and suffering and struggle. Struggle. The Christians in Philippi needed to persevere in their commitment to Christ even when adversity was attacking from every direction. Growing up, I would go on vacation in 
in Mexico. We lived in New Mexico, and there's about a, a 10 hour drive to a little beach town in, in Mexico. And we would stay for usually about five to seven days right there on the beach. It was beautiful. Love going down there. My dad lives down there now. And it seems like no matter when we would go, we would have one day when a storm would kick up, then the storm would go away, and that next day we would have massive waves. Usually in this part of, on the, this part of the ocean, like you barely see any waves. It's, it's beautiful. Get on a kayak, have some, have some fun. But always at one day, massive waves. And I remember being, I don't know, I was probably, probably 12 or 13 years old, my dad had allowed us to bring some friends down, and then of course we had met some friends, some, we had made some new friends while we were down there. And on this day, these massive waves were just pounding the shore. And we would walk, wade out into them and see how many we could withstand as these waves crashed into us. And one wave would crash and hit you up top, and then the, the other wave that from before it would cut underneath and pull the sand out from you, and you'd see how long you could stand firm before being violently tossed about the ocean, coming up, gasping for air, just to do it all over again. Thinking back, I, maybe that wasn't the smartest thing for us to do, but it was so much fun. But you know what we found out? We found out it was a lot easier to stand if we linked arms together. So when we get a group of us all linked arms, it would take a lot more for the waves to knock us down. When we were unified, we could withstand the waves for much, much longer than when we tried to do it on our own. You see, that such hostility from the world was meant to destroy the faith and to divide the body of Christ, to separate them from each other. And it's funny, Paul doesn't even focus on the identity of those who are in opposition to the church of Philippi. Instead, he focuses on what is an essential element of Christian faith, the unshakable determination to stand firm. You see, as Christians, we cannot flee or compromise or give in. We can't back down and we cannot be divided when we're facing hostile opposition. The command to stand firm that Paul uses here is actually a military term. It is like soldiers on a battlefield and they understand that they can't even yield an inch no matter how hard their adversaries press against them. The importance of standing firm is stressed throughout Paul's writings. And even later in, in chapter 4, verse 1, Paul repeats it as he tells the readers to stand firm. How can we stand firm when we're fighting against each other rather than side by side? See, we'll, when we're fighting against each other, all unity is lost. So at the end of this letter, you'll, as we get through the letter, you'll see that Paul is actually going to be urging two Christians who at that time were fighting against each other to be reconciled. And he actually told a mediator to help them because they had strived together at one point at Paul's side for the cause of the gospel. that same word, the same words that he used here when he says we have to strive together in one accord. And it's his reminder that these, these two women who were in conflict had previously been united. And Paul is seeking to unite that divided church. How can we withstand the onslaughts that the world throws at us if we're constantly divided by non-gospel issues? Now, now don't hear me wrong. There are times we need to be divided, but we divide over issues of the gospel, false doctrine, false teaching. We, don't, we should never be divided 
over non-essentials. Paul then moves on in verse 28 and exhorts them to courage. He says, not being frightened in any way by your opponents, because this is a sign of destruction for them, but of your salvation. See, after Paul starts by positively identifying what it means to stand firm, he then adds in the idea of what it wouldn't look like to stand firm. So it's the, the interesting thing with the Greek word where he's talking about the standing firm part, that word stand firm, it's not used anywhere else in the Bible. Nowhere else. But it is a rather common word used in Greek literature from that time, and, and one of Paul's contemporaries named Plutarch actually uses this word a number of times when talking about some of the battles that were happening in war. And one specific time, he, he uses the word about one of the Roman soldiers who died in battle because the horse was frightened, startled and rose up and fell, causing the death of the rider. See, the horse got agitated, frightened, jumpy. Paul's instruction to stand firm without being frightened calls for Christians not to be agitated or terrified as the battle for our nation, for our families, for our children rages about us. We're to stand firm, lined up, side by side. We shouldn't run from battle. We shouldn't run from the hard times. Some people find it difficult to understand how the, the opponents that Paul is speaking of would see that the, the faith of the church in the face of the opposition that they were giving as a sign of their own destruction. I mean, why would the opponents think that they would be destroyed when they saw the unity and steadfastness of the Christians? See, but at least for me, it's not hard to understand because I've got many friends who, who served overseas um, and they bring back the stories of the battles they fought. And one of my one of my friends is a uh, just stuck got caught in an ambush um, outside of of uh, Kabul, and it was just him and like four other guys, and there were a lot of people attacking them. Yet, as hundreds of people attacked their position, they stood firm, taking casualty after casualty until reinforcements finally arrived. But, but what this reminds me of, how, how do you think the enemy would feel? Knowing there's five people down there, we have about 200, and try as we might, we can't make them run. How demoralizing would that be as an enemy soldier Or even think back to uh, when I used to teach uh, combatives and martial arts. And there'd be times I'd be, I'd be sparring, I'd be in a fight, and I would hit someone with everything I had. Whap! And they'd stand there, and I'd do, it's going to be a long fight. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything else. And, uh, and they're just walking right through it. That is, that is what the opposition to the church in Philippi was facing. Paul was saying, listen, if you stand firm, these people who are coming up against you, they're going to look at that and they're going to say, I think we picked the wrong fight. I, mean, I love reading through the Old Testament, the stories of, of a little tiny people group from, from a man who left the his home to go to a land that he didn't know. And God chose the nation of Israel, not because they were massive and mighty and strong, but because they were nobodies from nowhere. 
and every battle they went up as they, they went through the promised land, they should have lost. They were out, I think, to the story of, of Caleb when the spies had gone into the land and, and come back and said, it's an amazing place. Flown with milk and honey, grapes the size of our heads. Like, this is awesome. But there are giants there. And to the giants, we look like little grasshoppers. This is the land that they were called to go into. And God had told them, even then, stand firm. Why, do, why can we stand firm in, in the face of such opposition? Is it because of the power and strength and might that we have? No. It's because of unity in Christ. Because when we are united in Christ, we are not fighting. He is fighting through us and, and for us. It's a lesson that took me a long time to learn. Because I enjoy fighting. I enjoy teaching people to fight. I enjoy sparring. My main jobs for my life involved some type of, of physical altercations. And, and God had to teach me something. He had to teach me that I shouldn't fight alone. Because that's not going to end up well. What if that's how our church was? What if when the world started their onslaught, their attack, what if when the world pressed us and opposed us, they saw how we stood firmly planted on the gospel in one spirit and in one accord, and they realize that their destruction is just a matter of time. Which is why Paul finishes in this area by exhorting us to steadfastness. Verse 29, it says, For it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had and now hear that I have. When I hear the, the term granted, I, things pop in my head. I hear like, okay, uh, someone is granted a pardon. Oh, that's a good thing. Uh, granted, maybe you got a, a, you applied for a new job at work and it was granted. Your application was granted. It, it's good stuff, which kind of confuses me a little bit when I read Paul here, and he says, you have been granted to suffer. Oh, well, okay, God, you, you know, grant me health, grant me um, safety, grant me a good job, but you can hold off on the suffering. I don't, But when we do that, we miss something. You see, granted means to give freely and graciously. And in the same way that God freely and graciously gave the opportunity for all people to believe in him, to be saved by the blood of God, he also freely and graciously gives us the opportunity to suffer for him. Suffering on the behalf of Christ is cause. Suffering on the behalf of Christ is caused by public identification with Christ in a hostile world. Let me say that again. When we are suffering on behalf of Christ, it is because we can be publicly identified as being with Christ in a world that is hostile to Christ. We're engaged in the same struggle. The same struggle that Paul is going through. Suffering, just as much as believing in Christ, is a gift of God's grace. What was the struggle that Paul was going through? Because he says 
you're engaged in the same struggle that you saw, but we know that Paul isn't there with them. But he follows it up with, and now here that I have. If we went back to Acts 16, verses 20 through 24, this is the account of Paul setting up the church of Philippi. And when I read it, it, it doesn't, um, I don't know if I want to be engaged in that same struggle. It says that the people bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews, and they are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. And after they had been severely flogged, they threw them in jail, ordering the jail, jailer to guard them carefully. That is the suffering that Paul is talking about here. It's like, hey, you remember when I came to you the first time? Remember when I came and I was sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus? And I was beaten with rods and jailed? It's been granted to you that same suffering. You know how I'm in prison now? Man, this is the suffering you've been granted. Let's rejoice in it. After he interprets the meaning of their suffering in light of their relationship with Christ, Paul adds a note that their relationship to him in their suffering, since you are going through the same struggle, you see, suffering can, can more easily be accepted as a gracious gift of God when we see how the gift of God's grace in the life of someone we love is demonstrated. Paul reminds his friends of his experience in suffering so they will have his example to follow in their same affliction. What came about because of Paul's suffering? Well, a vibrant, Christ-centered church in Philippi. And even here, just a few, a few verses before in, in Philippians 1, we read how, how Paul says, even here in jail, it is amazing. Because these jailers, they, gotta, they have to listen to me talk. And, and now they're getting the gospel. And my fellow prisoners, they're getting the gospel. And I know the people who threw me into prison did it to stop me, but all it has done is cause the gospel to spread faster and more places and to more people. Paul is reminding them, in your suffering, people will notice how you react. When we suffer, what does the world notice about us? Do they see us standing in unity, centered around the cross? Do they see us split, divided? You see, when we have the proper focus on suffering and we recognize that how we respond to our suffering is what the world is going to look at and that is where they will see who God really is. We notice who people are, who, they're tr who they truly are, what their character is, not in the good easy times, but in the times of suffering. The details of Paul's suffering were well known to the church of Philippi. What the believers saw of Paul's struggles, we may, we know from the account of, uh, that Paul wrote to the church in, in Thessalonia, where he said, talking about his visit to Philippi, he said, we had previously suffered and been treated outrageously in Philippi. but the gospel is advanced. You see, 
when we focus on how Paul saw his suffering as being used to spread the gospel and how many people were saved through his suffering, I think it makes it easier when we are going through suffering. Because if we're suffering for Christ and we stand firm and we're united with each other for the gospel, the world will take notice. And they'll shake in their boots. They will see that they're throwing everything they have, yet our footing and our foundation is firmly planted on the truth of the Bible. Satan will divide and discourage. And in a way to, in an attempt to stifle the spread of the gospel. But as Christians, we must stand firm together in the face of any persecution and suffering for the sake of the gospel. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know in a world that is divided, in a world that is hostile against us, that life is not always easy. But God, what we focus on will make all the difference. Not only in our life, but in the lives of those around us. So I pray, God, that we will not be discouraged by the, the hostility of the world as they, they come up against us. But God, that we will be encouraged by it. Because the world only stands up against the truth. The world is hostile against you, God. So when they are hostile against us, it is because they can see you in us. And that should be cause for rejoicing. So Lord, I pray, God, that as we move into this week, that we will not wallow in suffering, that we, that we will look, Lord, for the opportunity to share your love through it. We thank you, God, for today. We thank you for the safety that we have that we can meet openly and in public. But we also pray, God, today for our brothers and sisters across the world who right now are meeting in secret because of the persecution. And we pray, God, for the persecuted church, the churches in, in Iran and in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and China. Lord, as your word through suffering spreads like wildfire. And so, God, we pray, Lord, for that same determination to be found in our churches in our very lives, that when we encounter suffering and hostility, that it will motivate us more, God, to spread your love to all those around us. In your son Jesus' name we pray.